Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I must apologize. We're having a little technical difficulty. I will be speaking without a mic just for two minutes, but I promise you that our speaker will be wearing a mic, so, so you will at least be able to hear him, and maybe I'm sparing you something <laughs> if you can't hear me. Uh, so if we've not met, I'm Tom Collins. I'm the Neubauer Family Executive Director here at the Barnes Foundation, and it is my great pleasure to welcome each of you, both online and in person, to the Barnes Demasia Adult Education Program's annual Violette Demasia Lecture. Collectively, you in this room represent generations of Barnes students, instructors, dedicated volunteers, and are therefore a critical part of our history and our present life. This event celebrates our educational mission with a presentation by, and here I'm quoting from the language of the original gift, a speaker of significance in the world of art education, aesthetics, art criticism, or art history. We are very honored to present today's lecture by retired FBI agent and former Barnes student, Robert Whitman, who will discuss from his unique perspective the value of close looking, as Harry Safarbi, who was the renowned and beloved instructor of art appreciation here at the Barnes Foundation, for almost 50 years described it. We at the Barnes share a core belief that art has the power to bring us together and elevate us through shared experiences of the brilliant, the beautiful, and the sublime. And we remain committed to the power of our mission, which focuses on progressive education and access for all. And your continued participation and advocacy are essential to our collective success. So I thank you. Whether you take a class, whether you're a member, you volunteer as a docent, donating to support scholarships, or pledging as a member of our 1922 Legacy Society, please know that your involvement here at the Barnes and your service as ambassadors help us to ensure a vibrant future for the institution. So I thank you on behalf of our board, my colleagues on the staff, and the many audiences we serve for your support. And now it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Martha Lucy, who is our Deputy Director for Research, Interpretation, and Education, who will also be shouting. Ooh. Hello. Hello? Yes? All right. Good morning. Um, I am so, so happy to be with, here with you today. Um, this is my glasses off, I think. This is. This is truly one of my favorite programs of the year. Um, we, are here, we are here to celebrate our educational mission. Um, and this is also a celebration of all of you, all of our alums, um, our instructors, the people who understand our mission better than anyone and who are part of a legacy that stretches all the way back to 1925. Um, and who are really the embodiment of Barnes's original vision. You all know what a special community this, this really is. And of course, today is a celebration of the remarkable Violet de Mesia. Um, maybe some of you in the room have studied, studied with her. Um, this event began decades ago, thanks to the de Mesia Foundation. And today's event is supported by Jay Noreka, and his family, and thank you, Jay. I don't, you're here somewhere, but I, there, okay. Where are you? Thank you. <laughs> Hi, it's been a while, um, but Jay has become um, a good friend, and we're really grateful for your support. So I'm gonna read part of a letter that Albert Barnes, and I promise I'm not gonna go on. I just need to read this to you. Um, it's a letter that Barnes wrote to Leo Stein in 1914, and he happens to be writing about Renoir, and he's trying to explain why Renoir um, affects him so much. And he says, what strikes me is, um, whoops, where is it? The thing that most strikes a personal response is what seems to me his joy in painting the real life of red-blooded people and his skill in conveying his sensations to my consciousness. And I'm reading this because 
Um, you know, I, I read this letter for the first time so long ago, and I wasn't sure what it was that felt sort of surprising about this statement, but I think what it is is that he's not just writing about light line, color, and space when he talks about you know, how art impacts him, and of course that's central to it, but he's talking about the human experience that the work of art conveys. And the human experience that an artist pours into a work of art, and the human experience that is required to receive that art and to, and to grapple with it. And we all know exactly what he's talking about. The reason that I keep repeating human experience is because of the, of the time that we're in now, um, where human experience feels like something that we really have to actually sort of defend in this age of machine-generated content. Human experience, art made by humans, is so important. Um, and I'm so glad that we're all able to come together and appreciate it. We are committed to making art education available to everyone. Um, and we do that through, through scholarships um, that are generously supported by Betsy and Edward Cohen and the Dina Wind Art Foundation. Um, they are called our Richard, Richard Wattenmaker Adult Education Scholarship. Uh, it's called our scholarship fund, the Wattenmaker Adult Education Scholarship Fund, named for um, the esteemed scholar and uh, teacher and student, Richard Wattenmaker. Um, we are continuously working to expand and grow our courses that we offer to adults. We continue to offer courses in the galleries, but we have a really pretty large array online. If you haven't looked at them, please do. Every time you sign up for a course, you are supporting the Barnes Foundation. Please know that. Um, and so, before uh, I pass the podium to my colleague, Bill Perthes, I just want to make note and to, to remind you of the, the exhibition that we have coming up this summer. It's called Matisse and Renoir, New Encounters at the Barnes, and it's 35 works from, by these artists from the second floor. Um, so they're gonna be in the exhibition, special exhibition gallery, and then they will go back to the second floor when the exhibition is over, but this offers a chance to see them in a new context, and we are so excited about this because we know that it's gonna open up new dialogues about these works. So, with that, um, it is my pleasure, where are you, Bill, to introduce my friend and colleague, Bill Perthes, who is the Bernard C. Watson Director of Adult Education. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Good morning, everyone. Uh, well, it's a lively crowd. Bob, what, be on your toes. Hello, friends. Uh, welcome to all of you here, so many of you here in person, and all of you joining us online. It's so rewarding and refreshing to see so many people staying connected to the Barnes Foundation. Uh, you are living proof of the Foundation's ongoing commitment to education, and you are a living legacy to that mission, one started by Dr. Barnes, carried on by Violet Demasia, and instructors such as Mr. Safarbi, Mr. Church, and continued today with our current faculty, Kaylin Jewell and Michael Williamson. Uh, I'm Bill Perthes, the Bernard C. Watson Director of Adult Education, uh, and it's a pleasure to welcome all of you here this morning. And I'm equally as pleased to introduce our keynote spe speaker, Robert K. Whitman, who will present United States versus Art Thieves, True Tales from the FBI's Real Indiana Jones. He's not wearing the fedora, but uh, I assure you, He's equally as exciting. Bob is a retired FBI special agent who, in 2005, was instrumental in the creation of the FBI's Rapid Deployment Art Crime Team. During his 20-year career, Bob helped recover more than $300 million in stolen art. I suspect that number is probably even higher given the market today, as well as cultural property 
including masterpieces by Picasso, Renoir, Rembrandt, Goya, and more. Bob has represented the United States around the world, conducting investigations and sharing security and recovery techniques with international police and museums. He is the best-selling author of Priceless, How I Went Undercover to Rescue the World's Stolen Treasures, available in our gift shop. <laughs> Bob is, like you, as was mentioned, a proud alumni of the Barnes Foundation, having studied traditions with Harry Safarbi uh, in Marion. How many of you had Harry Safarbi as an instructor? Yes, the, we are fortunate ones for sure. Uh, following the, uh, Bob's talk, if there's time, we'll have uh, a little time for questions and answers, and that will also include people online, so feel free to put answers or uh, comments in, uh, in the chat there. So please, join me in welcoming Bob Whitman. Thank you, Bill. Pleasure. Appreciate it. Thank you. So, I'm back. <laughs> I love the barns. I got you. You guys all love the barns too, yeah. right? I mean, we all love the barns. And I, I, I speak all over the country. I talk to people all the time. And people ask me all the time, "What's what's the greatest museum?" And I, it's the barns. What else? I mean, where else are you going to see all these Renoirs and all these Cezanne? I mean, come on. You know, I don't care where you go, the Louvre, you know, or Musée d'Orsay, you know, wherever, it's the Barnes. So listen, thank you for all coming today. And I was asked to come in and talk a little bit about how the Barnes affected my career. And uh, it, it did, it really did, I have to say. You know, I grew up in a household of antiquities. My, my parents were antique stealers. I can't hear. You can't hear? Okay. My, my, my parents were antique stealers, is that better? I can only put it this close. <laughs> so I grew up in a household selling antiques. So as a result, I kind of knew about the business end of it. But back in the 1980s, uh, when I went in the FBI, I didn't join the FBI to be an art theft investigator or an antiques you know, uh, investigator. I wanted to be Sonny Crockett. Remember that from Miami Vice? <laughs> I wanted to be that guy with the white suit, you know, on the cigarette boat, right, in Miami, having fun, you know, and doing these deals and driving around in hot cars. So I thought, you know, that would be a lot of fun in the FBI. So I went through the academy, 16 weeks, and we did all the training and whatnot. And uh, they asked me where I wanted to go. So I said, I wanted to go to Miami, Hawaii. And, uh, <laughs> and because I came from Baltimore, I said, I'll go back to Baltimore, you know. So what they do, they sent me to Philadelphia. <laughs> so there was no cigarette boats, you know. None of that. I was one of 6,000 policemen in the city. And uh, we, the, the first case I got involved with was a theft from the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. It was, maybe some of you remember when the crystal ball was stolen from the museum? Well, because I was the new guy, you know, the young agent on the squad, Nobody else wanted to do that, <laughs> okay? They all wanted to do, you know, truck hijackings and, you know, cigarette loads and all this sort of thing. And it wasn't cool, you know, doing art theft. So because I was a new guy, I was assigned that case along with a partner, Bob Basin. So the two of us, we, we worked on that case, and ultimately we were able to recover that crystal ball. Uh, we got it back for the museum. It's there today in the Asian gallery, and you can go take a look at it. It's a beautiful piece, second largest in the world. I think it's over 50 pounds. And it's perfect. It was collected from the uh, Chinese Empress, uh, Empress Z, Xi, X I, who got it as a, she was called a dowager empress, and that was part of her dower, dowry. So as a result of that, and also investigating a theft from the Rodin Museum, maybe some of you remember the gunpoint theft where they stole the uh, man with the golden nose. Remember, the, 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 no, it was the man with the uh, broken nose, yeah, from the Rodin Museum. Well, we were able to recover that. We recovered that on, I think it was on Chestnut Street, and we caught the guy. He had the same gun on him that he used in that robbery, which was good, because <laughs> when he was in the robbery, he had shot around to the wall to prove to the guards it was a real gun, because it was one of those little uh, 25 Ravens, you know, it looks like a cigarette lighter. So the guards thought he was, you know, he was, he was uh, faking it, right? 
So he shot around. When we caught him, we found the gun, and we were able to uh, you know, do the ballistics and uh, attach that bullet to that gun. So it was good evidence. So as a result of that, the Bureau said, you know, they had no idea I was in the antiques world. Okay, they had no idea. But they said, you did pretty good with those cases. Why don't you do the art stuff? <laughs> and I thought, well, would I rather do drugs? You know? <laughs> At the time, it was the drug wars, the crack. And I had done about a year of that in North Philly and you know, West Philly. Or how about fugitives? Uh, or would I rather do art? And I thought art would be good. Okay, <laughs> so... so uh, I had went to some training at the uh, GIA, the Gemological Institute of America, and I learned a lot about diamonds, you know, and, and Zales Corporation in Dallas. We went to their training academies, and I learned a lot about jewelry. So gem and jewelry theft became part of the program. And then we had to do about art. Now, I knew about antiques, because my parents said that. But I didn't know anything about fine art. So in 1991, and I hate to say that, because how many of you were in the classes back in the 90s? Anybody? A couple of us? Yeah. Good. Good to see you. Yeah. You were probably in one of my classes. In 1991, I did the first year of the program. I only did one year. Okay? Only, only one year because that's all I needed for what I was going to do. And what was so great about it was the fact that looking at this artwork very closely, you know, gave me a little bit of an eye. It trains the eye for what you're supposedly, be, supposedly looking at. So at that point, um, you know, I could tell the difference after a year between, say, a Picasso and a Cezanne. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a big deal, I tell you. Or a Miro and a Renoir, you know? Really. I, so, you know, most policemen on the street, if you get pulled over, can you, you say to the police officer, hey, you know the difference between a Renoir, a Renoir and a Picasso? He'll look at you like you're crazy. <laughs> you know? Well, that was helpful. So, I mean, it was a little bit better than that. But learning about genres, learning about the palette, learning about strokes, learning about a little bit of the history of the, of, of the art world itself, put me in a position to feel comfortable. All right? That doesn't make me an expert. All right? I wasn't an expert. I couldn't go out and identify a painting and say, yes, that's a Jackson Pollock, or that's a real Mark Rothko. But at least I know what they look like. <laughs> okay? So if somebody showed me something outrageous, I could say, well, I don't think that's good. Of course, I'd have to get it looked at and have it authenticated, but it's at least it gives you an eye, which makes you comfortable in the world to be able to speak about it. And that's why in 2005, when I started the FBI National Art Crime Team, I actually brought them here for training for the first time. We went here to the Philadelphia Museum of Art for conservation training and the UPenn to learn about art of the antiquities you know, and uh, 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 you know, thing, things of that nature. Egyptian antiquities, uh, different types. So the first training for the National Archive team was here in Philadelphia. And the reason for that was because that's where I lived. <laughs> okay, It's the only reason. And uh, we had all these contacts, and, and they still do it today. I was talking to Bill today, just a couple of weeks ago, they actually had the team in, they were given training again. Because it's all new agents. Agents leave every 20 years. It's a generational thing. And most of the agents on the art crime team I think there's one left, maybe, from 2005. Everybody else is, has dispersed. Because it is a collateral duty. It's not a full-time job. I was the only one at the time who had it as a full-time job. But as a such, it's a collateral duty. They do other things. They're doing drug cases. They're doing fugitive cases, money laundering, and art as well. So the, uh, the point was, they, they came a couple of weeks ago, we, and we've continued the training. And they were here actually learning how to see again, which is a really important thing when it comes to artwork. So that's why the, the Barnes is such an important place for me. It was my, shall I, shall I say, my beginnings you know, in the art world. Uh, I knew how to do a deal, but I didn't know how to identify art. Now, when we talk about art crime, it's all about the deal. It's not about the art history. You know, we, we know all these stories about these great artists, you know, Renoir having you know, arthritis so badly he had to append brushes on his uh, wrist to be able to paint. And, you know, Monet lost his uh, eyesight, couldn't see. These are all famous stories. Van Gogh cutting off his ear and whatnot. Famous stories of the artists. These are all art history. When we talk about art crime, it's about the business of art. Okay? Uh, I'll show you this because we're doing the top talk today. I do five different talks. 
Um, and you know, if, uh, if any of you are interested in these types of uh, subjects or talks, let, let us know. Um, I, I just did a series for the Smithsonian where we did five talks. It's five talks for the UPenn and five talks for Christie's Education. So if you need something like that, let me know. This is the first one today. This is why criminals get involved in art theft. All right? Now, when the FBI talks about art theft, it's not just fine art, prints, and sculptures. It's the collecting world. It's all parts of cultural property. These are the newest pieces of cultural property that are going for incredible amounts of money. This Tom Brady rookie card sold for $2.5 million. <laughs> Superman, now that says $3.5 million. Yesterday, it sold in Texas for $6 million. That comic book, not that specific one, another one, sold for $6 million. So it's not unique. $6 million. This uh, Mario Brothers game, some of you had children from the 80s. You got, you got your game up in your attic? <laughs> hey, $660,000. It just went for this ball. And this is the kicker. This is a Mickey Mantle rookie card. Mickey Mantle rookie card from the 50s, not signed. Recently sold for $12 million. So anybody here got one? <laughs> Let's talk, okay? Now, this was in near mint condition, but if you have one that's crappy, <laughs> you'll still get 150000 for it. So it's an amazing thing. So as a result, when these things happen, when these prices are, are advertised, what do you think happens with criminals? Hey, it becomes a target. It's something to look at. Hey, you know what? It's easier than a bank robbery. Bank robberies net less than $1,000 on average, and it's a federal crime. If somebody comes into your, your, your bedroom while you're on vacation and they steal your Mickey Mantle rookie card, it's not a federal crime. It's a, a local theft, and when you call the you know Philly PD, and they send uh, you know and you, and you want to make a complaint, you say somebody stole my baseball card. What do you think they're going to say? <laughs> really? You know? Okay. So that's the difference. That's what they know they can do. They can get away with these things, and it's a lot more you know it's a lot more uh, uh, lucrative than stealing artwork. Like that Mickey Mantle is not unique. So how do you identify it? Once you take it out of that case, there's no identifiers. There's m many of them around. So that's, that's the problem. That's why criminals follow art and art theft. So that's the crime part. Then there's the art industry. It's a $200 billion worldwide industry every year. $200 billion with a B. Not just fine art sculptures and prints. It's also the collectibles, collectibles industry. Baseball cards, football cards, the the, you know, the uh, comic books, antique cars, all of that. 40% or $80 billion is the United States industry when it comes to this entire cultural property market. We're number one in the world when it comes to collecting. We're not number one producing, but we're number one collecting in the world. So back around 2005, I was uh, called by our, our PR people in Washington, and they said, you know, Agent Whitman, what is it? We got a call from the New York Times. We're interested in knowing what is the art crime, illicit property crime industry worldwide. In other words, how much is stolen? How much is fraud? How much is forgery a year in the world? So we had no idea. It's not, you know, theft reports aren't broken down by art. <laughs> it's just the theft, retail theft, wholesale theft, not art theft. So we contacted the um, uh, Scotland Yard Art and Antique Squad. We talked to the uh, OCBC, which is the French Art Antique Squad in Paris. We spoke to the Carbonieri in Italy. And we did an estimate of about $6 billion illicit cultural property worldwide. That's how much gets stolen. That's how much it's frauds, forgeries, and fakes throughout the world every year. And since then, my understanding is the FBI has upped that number because of the raise in value, the rise in value of art and cultural property antiques. So right now, it's over $6 billion a year. Now, I would tell you, because I'm in the industry, I'm in the business, probably 75% of that is not theft. It's fraud. It's a fraud, forgeries, and fakes. Which means if you're going to buy a Picasso on eBay, <laughs> make sure that there's two S's in Picasso. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Eh? And that, you know, Jackson Pollock's name, Pollock spelt right, okay? <laughs> You'd be surprised. So that's, that's the situation with, with the overall art industry. The public resource to protect you is, uh, that we have 
available along with the regular PD is the FBI Art Crime Team. They're in existence. Uh, I think they have more than 20 agents today. Uh, they've been around since 2005 when I founded the group. At the time when I founded the team, we had eight agents nationwide, and they're up over 20 today. I think they've recovered hundreds of millions of dollars worth of uh, fine art cultural property. They've done a great job. Um, okay, I'm going to tell you some stories. <laughs> so everything I talk about, all the stories I tell you are stories I was involved with, okay? I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not telling you cases that I didn't have anything to do with. It. It's what I did, but that's all I know. That's why I can stand up here and talk to you without reading anything, because I got, all I got to do is remember. And if I don't remember, I'll just lie. So, <laughs> so I'm going to tell you about stories I did. This art crime team, this is the logo. If you look on the FBI website today, under fbi.gov slash art, art crime team, you'll see that logo. And you can see what it means. It's ACT, obviously Art Crime Team. And the artworks behind it were the 10 missing artworks back in 2005. So you might have heard of you know, the top 10 fugitives, Osama bin Laden and others. Well, we, we wanted to play off of that because we wanted to get good publicity for the team and a lot of you know, uh, public help. So we picked our top 10 art pieces that were missing in 2005. And I'm happy to tell you today, uh, a number of these have been recovered. Remember the screen was stolen? That's been recovered. The Madonna and Charles da Vinci, it was in Scotland, that's been recovered. Behind the sea, up top is the Cellini salt cellar. It was stolen from a museum in Austria, in Vienna. That's been recovered. This piece over here behind the T is a Van Gogh. That got recovered three years ago. It was in the basement of a Sicilian mobster's mother's house in Sicily. That was stolen from the Van Gogh Museum. That has also been recovered. So at least four out of these 10 pieces have been recovered. Now, none of them did the FBI have anything to do with, but we have it on our website, so we get credit. <laughs> <laughs> now, the other thing about this, uh, <laughs> true story. I got a call in 2005 when we were creating the team, and it was the people from headquarters from Washington, and they're all very stuffy, you know. They, and they called me up and they said, yeah, Agent Whitman, what are you, I'm in Philadelphia here, what, what do you want to call this new team? And I said, well, I'm, I'm on the phone, I'm, I'm listening, I'm, I'm looking at resumes of agents that were applying. We had 75 agents around the country that wanted to be on the team. I was shocked. I didn't think anybody wanted to be in the art theft division, right? I mean, but 75 people applied, so we're looking, I only had eight spots. So he says, what do you want to call the team? We want to do a big rollout, which we did. And we need a good name. So I'm thinking, you know, I'm looking, I'm reading, I'm thinking at the same time. I'm thinking, oh, well, it's federal. It's a federal team. It's not local. It's art. Okay, federal art recovery team. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's a silence on the phone. And he says, I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> I said, well, why not? He said, let's just, I don't know, it's too many letters. <laughs> So he said, what about Art Crime Team, ACT? I said, okay. So even today, it's the Art Crime Team. But I do like the Federal Art Recovery Team. <laughs> but you know, my friends, it, there is a limitation to law enforcement. I mean, we can rely on law enforcement to do a lot for us. But when it comes to the art world, it's not really that helpful. And why? Well, throughout my career, I probably got uh, upwards of 500 complaints a year, you know, around the country for people who have problems. Probably 10 were criminal, the rest were civil. And even today, 80%, 85% of the business I do is all civil complaints. It's people who are, they, you know, they've been defrauded, but it's not a criminal fraud. It's, it's basically somebody bought, bought a fake from somebody, or it's, you know, an estate, and they're trying to identify, and brothers and sisters are fighting <laughs> over who owns what. You know, these are the types of things that we run into mostly in the art business. Occasionally, you'll get a crime. And usually when that happens, there's going to be a lot of publicity about it. You know, whenever you read about these articles, there's always an article in the paper or in the, new, you know, the, in the mass media about some type of fraud or theft in art. But that's because it's so seldom that you don't see it very often. That's why they play it up. So just honestly, it's mostly civil, civil cases. At maybe 10 a year, I would look into, and probably five of those uh, we couldn't do anything about. You know, we would clear people. So maybe five cases a year. But that's a lot of cases over 20 years. It's 100 cases. So it, it all depends on how you look at it. 
That's what we do today. I started my own company in 2010. It's uh, Robert Whitman Incorporated. We do art recovery. We go out and find art that's stolen. We work with collectors for collection management services. We just did the, uh, um, the uh, security survey for the entire National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., created a report for them. We do due diligence and provenance reviews so you don't buy stolen art. You don't want to do that. <laughs> it's a problem. And we do a lot of expert witness testimony. Any big case in New York that involves fraud, I'll be in it, one <laughs> way or the other, okay? And we do TV shows. This was a show we, uh, we did in uh, Montana. We were actually looking for the artifacts from Custer's last stand, you know, the battle in Montana. All of his uh, guns and, and, and carbines and swords are missing from that battle because the, supposedly the Native Americans after the battle took it all. And then they hid them supposedly in the mountains and they're worth millions of dollars if you could find them. So we did a, a season, a series of episodes for the History Channel where we didn't find anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like, you know, like there's shows on History Channel where they're looking for something and they never find it. <laughs> you know? But it looks close, maybe, you know. <laughs> Never found it. So, this is what we look at. This is why people are interested in art theft, right? <laughs> this is why you're interested. We think that they're handsome and debonair and beautiful. That's uh, Catherine Zeta Jones and Sean Connery. You remember the movie? Yeah. Entrap. Entrap. And good, good memory. And of course, the guy in the middle? Thomas Pierce Brosnan. Pierce, Pierce Brosnan. <laughs> Thomas Crown Affair. How many, how many ladies, how many of you like Pierce Brosnan? Right. The reason I ask you that is because after this is over, well, what happened was when Priceless first came out, Pierce called me, and he said, you know, we're interested in maybe uh, buying your book and making a, you know, a series out of it. I said, oh, that's great. I said, are you going to play the, the role? And he said, no. He said, I'm a movie star. This is for TV. <laughs> and now he's on TV, right? So, so what happened was uh, it didn't work out. You know, that's just a place to say. But the reason I ask you that is because after this is over, we're going to have reception, and for 50 bucks, I'll give you a cell phone number. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and I go, at the guy at the end, now we know who he is. So when I go and speak at Penn or, you know, at, uh, you know UCLA or someplace, the kids have no idea. <laughs> um, you know, but we knew who And he was famous, of course. And he did the, uh, the Catch a Thief back in 1955, remember? And he played a jewel thief. But these are who we think of. You know, Cary Grant and the rest He's handsome, debonair, beautiful, intelligent, rich art thieves. <laughs> the longer you look at that, the funnier it's going to get. <laughs> you know, they aren't handsome, debonair, rich, they're not smart. If they're smart, they get away with it, <laughs> quite honestly. But uh, this group was involved in millions of dollars worth of uh, thefts from Philadelphia, from our, from our area and our neighborhoods. And so we're going to talk about three of these guys today, not all of them, but the three here who just happen to be dressed alike. You notice that? That's a coincidence, isn't it? <laughs> not really. <laughs> they were a team. They were working together. And uh, we're going to talk about them today. Now, these three guys were friends from childhood. And they grew up in Bucks County. And they went to school together, high school, and they decided to get into the antiques business. So they started to go out and collect antiques, and they were riding around like on trash days, you know, as pickers to go collect these antiques. So they would find a piece here, a piece there, you know, maybe a piece of furniture, and they'd repair it or do whatever they had to do to it. And they would take it to the local antique auction once a month, and they'd sell it. And they made a few dollars. And they were feeling good about that. So it was a March night, and they're riding around. It's Friday night. They've been drinking a lot of beer. <laughs> okay, And they decided that we don't have anything for Tuesday's lecture. So what do we do? Well, they looked at each other, and they thought, you remember that place that we went to in the fifth grade? It was a, a historic place. It was the Pensbury Manor up in Bucks County. Of course, that's the home, former home of William Penn. It's a historic site. How many people have been to Pensbury Manor? There you go. We're all, we're all from here, mostly. So yeah, it's a historic site. 
William Penn uh, had it built in 1683 till 1700. And I know that because it says it right on that plaque. Right? <laughs> you know, I'm a big historian, right? <laughs> anyway, so uh, as a result, they said, let's go there because, you know, they had a lot of great antiques. And we could take some out of there and sell them at the antique, you know, sale on Tuesday. Brilliant. <laughs> okay. So they drive up to uh, the William Penn, uh, Pensbury Manor. And you, you remember the first Mission Impossible movie? <laughs> remember that? Remember when, when Tom Cruise was being let down from the ceiling to steal the information out of that computer? And everything on the floor is, is wired. If, if one bead of perspiration falls on the floor, anything, all the alarms will go off, everybody comes running, and they're going to get arrested, right? Well, that's not what happened. <laughs> <laughs> what happened was, when we got there, I got a call from the state police. It's a Saturday morning. Everything always happens on Saturday. Nothing happens all week. They got to call me on Saturday morning, all right? So it's Saturday morning. A trooper calls me. says, we had a robbery at the Pensbury Manor. He says, can you come up and give us a hand with the investigation? Because I was the art theft guy. So I said, okay. His name is Tony. Tony Redunda, a great guy. So I said, okay, Tony, I'll come up. So I, I drove up to Pensbury Manor, and uh, we went up there. You see that door right there to the front door? You see the, uh, the handle? Well, next to that handle was a big money footprint. Well, that's a clue. <laughs> yeah, I, I went to Quantico for 16 weeks. I'm a trained investigator. And I'm telling you, that's a clue, all right? Well, you know what? It, it truly is a clue, because I'll tell you why. 89% of museum thefts in the United States are inside jobs. Sorry, Barnes people. <laughs> yeah, 89%. That meant that, you know, nine times out of ten when you had a missing piece, somebody from inside took it. And here's the thing. It not necessarily is it going to be a curator or, you know, a guard or anything like that. It could be someone who's just a docent. How many docents we got? <laughs> We're watching you. <laughs> Truly, it's, a, it's it, anybody. It could be an expert that goes in and studies collections. I had cases like that all over and over again, you know rare books, documents, uh, ivory pieces out of Princeton, over and over. These people go in, they study these collections, they take them, and they walk out with them. One of the biggest map thieves in the country stole a, a map at, at Yale University in the Beinecke uh, um, uh, Library. And as he was leaving, he had, a, he had a knapsack, he was stopped, and he dropped an exacto knife. That's how they knew. And then he turned around, and we found that he stole 100 maps from libraries as far as you know, the British Library, all the way through the United States. So that's what happens. People go in, they have the keys to the kingdom, and they steal. But in this case, we got this big money footprint. So what's that tell me? It tells me it probably was an inside job, <laughs> right? Because if it was an inside job, they wouldn't have to kick the door in, would they? So, but we still had to talk to all 100 people who worked there, all the docents, all the people who went in, Ultimately, the state police and I, the local PD, we interviewed everybody. And we had no leads because we kind of figured this is going to be an outside burglary. So we did what good police do. We took all the files and we stuck them in a, on, a, on, a, on a ledge and just left them there. <laughs> and we waited. Well, we didn't wait in vain. About uh, six weeks later, uh, one of these individuals, I, I can't go backward on, there, on, this, on this, I can't show you his face, but it was the guy in the middle of the top, right? He was, uh, he was driving down I-95 outside of where the Pensbury Manor is. I think it's Abington, I think, up in that area. But he's driving down I-95, and it's a Friday night, about 11 o'clock, and he's weaving. So a very, you know, astute state, young state trooper sees this and suspects him of a DUI. So he pulls him over. So as he's walking to the car, he gets a flash on his radio. It said, be on the lookout. There was a burglary of a pizza parlor right there in the town they were outside of, and a safe from the pizza parlor had been stolen. So this is the, 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 you know, the flash on the radio. Well, this trooper, he's not paying attention to that, okay? Because let's face it, he's got a car pulled over 11 o'clock on Friday night on the highway, and he's very, very focused on this. So he walks up to the car, he says, license and registration. How many people have been stopped? <laughs> we all know, <laughs> License and registration. So the fellow pulls out his wallet, gets his license and registration out, and gives it to him. So the trooper looks at it, 
and looks him in the face and has a, you know, he has a uh, flashlight. And everything is okay. It's correct. It's the guy. It's his name. It's his face. The uh, well, driver's license not expired. Renewal and the uh, uh, registration is good. So, he, but he smells. He smells beer. Smells alcohol. So he does a, what we call a wing spread search, which means he's not searching the car. He's not going in. He just takes his flashlight and looks in the back seat. And underneath the, the driver's side on the back seat on the floor was a safe. <laughs> that's a clue. <laughs> Yeah, that's a clue, even for a young state trooper. Now, troopers are great. I got any troopers in here? No? Yeah, they do great work. Anyway, so he sees his safe. He hadn't heard the ball well. He had to be on the lookout. So what's he do? He says, that, he figures that's the safe from the uh, pizza parlor. Well, he arrests the individual for a suspected DUI. Meanwhile, he gets the owner of the pizza parlor to come over and identify the safe. So now he's in on a burglary charge and DUI. So the next morning, that person, he calls the state police and his attorney, and they say, we got information about the big Pensbury Manor heist, $350,000 of, of antiques. So state trooper calls me. Now remember, this was Friday night this happened. So when's he call me? Saturday morning. <laughs> so I, I get in the car, I drive up to Pensbury Manor, I drive up to the, to the uh, lockup up there in Bucks County, and uh, we go and we interview the guy. And we start talking to him, and he says, yeah, I was involved. He says, uh, my two friends were with me, gives us their names, their addresses. They were there, too. And, you know, yeah, we took the stuff. We thought we'd sell it at the antique show or antique uh, sale, but we didn't sell it. Okay, great. Right? Good news. So where is it? Let's go get it. That's the next thing. Because it was always the most important thing to me was that I wanted to catch the individuals, but I wanted to recover the art. That's the main thing. You know, the theft is just a blip in the history of the artwork. The provenance might have something about theft, but it's the art coming back that's important. So we said, where is it? He said, well, we wrapped it all up in green trash bags, and we hid it in my girlfriend's garage, in the back of the garage. So we said, great, who's your girlfriend? Give us the information. So by the time we got all that done, we go to the girlfriend's house. Now it's 9 o'clock at night. All right, so we knock on the door. Myself, I got a rough BI raid jacket on, state troopers got his state troopers jacket on, and a gentleman answers the door. And it turns out it's the girl's father. So she lives at home, she's 19. So here's the thing at, at, on a Saturday night at 9 o'clock, when the FBI and the state police show up at your door <laughs> and ask for your daughter, you're probably going to tell your daughter, tell them everything you know, <laughs> just, just cooperate. So she comes out, and we say, You know, we're here to talk to you about your boyfriend. And uh, the stuff that he put into the green trash bags, where are they? And she said, well, they stuck them in the back of the, of the garage. I don't know what was in them. I have no idea. She said, all they did was put them back there. I said, okay, well, let's go get them. And she said, well, didn't they tell you? I said, tell me what? She said, we got rid of them. I said, what do you mean you got rid of them? She said, well, we took them all down to Philadelphia. We threw them in the Delaware River. <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> Same thing. So I said, really? I said, okay, all right, get in the car. Let's go down to where it was on Columbus Boulevard. It was behind the Coast Guard station. That's there. They threw him in the river back behind there. So we went down. The next day, we, uh, we called the city police uh, dive team, the Philadelphia PD, and we got them to go into the river, and they started to uh, pull things up for us. And you can kind of see, that's Tony Redunda, the state trooper, myself. And all this material was actually in the river, in the green trash bags. And if you look, what's great, it's been in there for maybe six weeks, a long time. All this is all the pewter, all the you know steel material that was stolen. And that's great that it came back up. But if it wasn't made out of steel after six weeks, it, it went away. And, and we lost this. And this was a, uh, a, a jewelry casket, actually owned by Mrs. Penn. So that's was owned by the Penn family and was in the house since 1700. So, you know, as a result of it being made of wood, it floated down in Delaware, and we lost it. Probably valued at about 75000 at the time, you know? But, hey, that's, it's, not the, it's not the dollar value that's important. It's the value of the cultural history. And there's nothing, <coughs> nothing equates to going and seeing the real thing, okay? Remember that song, Ain't Nothing Like the Real Thing, Baby? They were talking about something else, but... This is the same thing, all right? This is the real thing. 
And you know, they've replaced, they've replaced, they brought another one, but it wasn't pens, you know. And, and for us, being the, you know, residents of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, the founder of our area, you know, it was important, so we lost that. And that's the real damage that art theft and art thieves do when they go out and do these things. You know, you get them back, and they're not real smart. And oftentimes, you know, they're silly with what they do, but they can do a lot of real damage. And especially when we lose our history and our cultural heritage. As a result of this case, uh, it was the first time in the United States that these guys were prosecuted under a new law that was passed in 1996. And that law was the Theft of Major Artwork Statute. And what that art law, art law says, Congress passed it, it made a federal crime to steal from a museum. So anything stolen from a museum in the United States worth $5,000 or more and over 100 years old or worth over $100,000 at any, any age is considered a federal crime now. It was passed in 96. It was put forth by Ted Kennedy from Massachusetts. And there's two parts to the statute. The first is if you steal it. The second part, the B part, is anyone who possesses an art, art, a piece of cultural property stolen from a museum, who possesses or transports or sells or exhibits. Why would you think Ted Kennedy from Boston would want to make it a crime to possess stolen material from a museum? OK, the Isabella Store Gardner Museum. How many people here know about that? Of course you do. How many, you know, a better question. And you can tell me, how many people don't know about it? <laughs> OK, all right. for those of you who don't know about it, in 1990, 1992, individuals dressed as Boston police officers they convinced the two guards in the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum to let them in, uh, at which point they went around the museum. Of course, they weren't police officers. They tied these guards up at gunpoint. They stole 13 objects of art, including a Vermeer concert, which is the only Vermeer missing in the world, and a Rembrandt seascape known as the Storm Over the Sea of Galilee. Both of these pieces, total value of the heist that night was $300 million. Today, the, value, the paintings have never been recovered and they're valued at $500 million. That makes that the single largest property crime in US history. It's not the biggest you know, fraud. It made off, these other frauds are bigger, but it's the single largest property crime. Who would have thought that an art heist would be the single largest property crime in US history? So as a result today, there's a $10 million reward for information leading to the recovery of the paintings. So if any of you know where they're at, <laughs> call me, OK? We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. So as a result, we were able to prosecute these individuals under the theft of major artwork statute. They got four-year prison sentences. And it was the first time that that statute was used. Lucky for Philadelphia, right? <laughs> Good old Philly. Uh, we can't just talk about antiquities. We have to talk a little bit about art, too. This case involved a. Uh, theft and recovery of a $35 million Rembrandt. It was stolen at gunpoint in the year 2000, December 23rd, 2000, from the uh, National Museum in Stockholm. Look at a beautiful little painting. It's, uh, it was done in 1630 when Rembrandt was 24 years old. I love the chorus score. You guys have all taken the courses, so you know. And this is when he was 24 years old, he was using the technique. And of course, that's used everywhere today. Photography, everything, all great photography you see. Clare Scores used the shadow technique on the face. So he did it on himself, and he did this piece on copper using gold flakes in the paint. And it's one of the primary pieces at the museum, National Museum, in Stockholm, Sweden. And I'm sure a lot of you have been to Stockholm. Yeah, did you go to the museum? Did you see the painting? <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah, you saw it. Good for you. It's, that was Ellen, Aaron. Ellen Lynch, she saw it, so good, good. I got a couple pieces hanging in the Musée d'Orsay, too. And I got two in Nice at the Farmers Museum in Nice that are hanging in there. So that's pretty cool. Anyway, um, this piece was stolen from the Stockholm Museum. Three individuals went in with machine guns on that night. It was December 23rd, 2000, 5 o'clock in the evening. They go with machine guns. They put everybody on the floor. Now, remember, it's dark. It's cold. It's getting close to Christmas. This is a good situation for them. They go in, they steal three paintings, two by Renoir and, and the single uh, Rembrandt. Total value of the heist when they did this was $42 million. They uh, then made their getaway by, by, by uh, you see, the, the museum's right on the uh, pier. And they had set up two car bombs to the main roads 
leading to the museum, and that stopped the police and fire department. It took them 40 minutes to respond, to get past the traffic, to get there. So they had that much time to get away. Of course, they couldn't go back by car. So what they had done was they had parked a high-speed boat right on the pier in front of the museum. So when they ran out of the museum, they jumped onto their high-speed boat and took off up into the harbor. So it was a pretty good heist, right? Machine guns, car bombs, tax strips after the car bombs to stop responders getting away in a high-speed boat. Well thought out heist. Uh, they, they go up into the harbor, they pull over to a pier, and they get out of the boat. And as they do that, there was a fisherman who just happened to see these three guys jump out of a boat and take these packages and run up into the city, up, on, up the steps into the city. So the next morning, the fisherman calls the police because there's a big spread in the newspaper about the big heist, 42 million, largest heist in Swedish national history. So they, they call the police. The police go visit him. They say, OK, well, what would you see? He said, well, I don't know. I saw these three guys jump out of this car, I mean, out of this uh, boat, run up into the city there carrying these packages. But I got the number of the boat. So he hands over the number of the boat. So they asked him, well, what happened? And he said, well, these guys came to me probably two months ago, and they bought the boat. And that's all I know, because it was his boat. So they turn around and say, OK, great, no, no problem. They, they, they start to walk out, because there's, there's not much there, right? They don't, he doesn't know who they are. So as they're leaving, he says, well, wait a minute. He says, one, one more thing. He said, they used a credit card. Here's a credit card number. <laughs> That's a clue. Yeah. <laughs> so what happens? Of course, they get the credit card, and they arrest 10 people that were involved in the heist, seven people that were all involved in the, in the conspiracy and, and, and thinking about it, and three people who actually went in. So they put them all on trial. trial. Seven of them were convicted. They recovered one of the Renoirs. In the, in the arrests, and seven were convicted, three were acquitted, and then that was it, that was 2001. Fast forward now, 2005, five years later. So I had created the art crime team, and I had an agent who was working out in Los Angeles, his name was Chris. So Chris calls me, and he says, Bob, what do you know about a big heist of a Renoir, maybe from Sweden a few years ago? And I said, gee, I don't know, Chris, I, uh, wait a minute, I, I Googled it, you know? And I said, yeah, there was a big heist a few years ago in, in, in uh, Sweden. And he says, yeah, yeah, I Googled it too. I said, okay. <laughs> I said, okay. He says, so what's happening is this. We've got this drug deal going on. There's a drug dealer here in LA. His name is Boris. And Boris has already done a two kilo deal with us. And as a result, he's looking at 10 years in prison. And Boris is talking on the wiretap about selling a Renoir that's stolen that he has here in LA. I said, okay. And he supposedly has it from Sweden. So I said, you know, that's great. I said, look, you know, we get drug deals all the time. You know, we all work drug deals. But if we can get that painting back, that would be great for the New York crime team. So he says, okay, I'll see what we can do. So he's watching, looking forward. They're doing their investigation. Finally, he calls me a few weeks later and says, good news. This is a Friday afternoon, not Saturday. <laughs> Friday afternoon, good news, we got the Renoir. I said, what happened? He said, well, Boris talked about moving it on the wiretaps, so we followed him. He went to this uh, coin shop over near Wilshire Boulevard. Inside the coin shop in the safe was the Renoir. So when he came out with it, we were able to arrest him, and we got the Renoir back. I said, that's fantastic. fantastic. It was called La Parisienne. They had taken it to uh, the Getty. The curators there identified it, and they authenticated it. So I said, what are you going to do? He said, well, Monday, the special agent in charge here in LA wants to have a big press conference. So I said, well, before you do that, why don't you see if Boris knows where the Rembrandt is? Because that's worth $35 million. That's These, those Renoirs are worth about $3 million a piece. Nice paintings. About $35 million, right? <laughs> $35 million for the Rembrandt. So he says, okay. He says, so he goes back, talks to Boris. They talk to Boris. Boris says, yeah, that painting's still in Sweden. And he says, uh, but I can, I can introduce you to who has it if you're willing to work with me on my, on my sentencing, you know, for my kilos deal. So what we did, we started Operation Bullwinkle. And that, in that case, I was working undercover as an authenticator for the Russian mob who was going to make the deal in Sweden with the thieves to get the run grant back. And what we did was, uh, we called it Operation Bullwinkle because we had Boris the Bulgarian. <laughs> yeah, we didn't have Rocky or anything like that, or Natasha, but we had Boris. And you know, now you don't have the FBI makes these names, right? I'll tell you, the best one I ever heard was Operation Bullpen. 
And that was about sports, fake sports memorabilia, right? Bullpen, you get it with the baseball, but with fake baseballs with uh, signatures. Isn't that a great name? <laughs> Bullpen, right? <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, yeah, we had some Einstein fake signatures here in Philly that we were going after at the same time for that case. So anyway, we, uh, we go back to uh, Boris, and Boris says, yeah, we can introduce you to these thieves in Sweden. So we go to Sweden, we talk to the Swedish National Police, and uh, we have this meeting in Stockholm, uh, three agents on this side, and all these prosecutors and, and uh, police on the other side of the, of the conference room table. And they said, we don't think you can do it. We don't think there's any way you can get this back. So I was talking to the uh, chief prosecutor, and I said, I'll bet you 20 euros we do it. And uh, he, he never paid up. <laughs> anyway, he still owes me. So we, uh, we, we did the meetings. Uh, we decided we would have to do this uh, in Copenhagen because Boris had an arrest warrant in Sweden, and they wouldn't let him into the country without arresting him. And that wouldn't help. <laughs> okay, so we decided to set it up in Sweden, I mean Copenhagen, in Denmark. This is the uh, Scandic Hotel that we use in Copenhagen. It's right next to the train station. How many people have been to Copenhagen? There you go. Did you stay at one of the Scandics? There's like three of them. Now, this is the one right next to the train station. So we decided to use this hotel because it was convenient for the uh, criminals to come visit us, you know, on the train from Stockholm. This was the room I used. Remember, I'm big time Russian authenticator, Russian mobster, uh, working for the Russian mob, uh, actually an American working for them. And, you know, I'm going to do this huge deal for $35 million painting. But you see, we have these per diems that the U.S. government <laughs> makes us use. So I didn't want to waste any taxpayer dollars on this. So this was my room, okay, in the Scandic to do the undercover operation. So we start meeting with these guys. We do maybe two weeks uh, in Copenhagen. We'd already been talking to them for probably three months. And we agreed on $250,000 in cash for the $35 million Rembrandt. Now remember, no one's made any money on this in five years since the heist. So they're finally going to make 250000 in cash. Um, I tell them, go home, get the painting, come back. We're done talking. The Russians are, you know, they're ready to go. So they say, okay. They leave. Next morning, I get a call from the uh, Swedish National Police, and they said, good news. The three guys were running back and forth to different houses the night before. All three have gotten back on the train. It's a five-hour train ride, and they're coming south to Copenhagen, and they're carrying a bag. Inside the bag is a rectangle object about the size of the painting. They say to me, do you want us to stop them? I said, no, let them come. Let them make this happen. Let's make sure we do it right. They say, okay, this is the Swedish police. Give them credit. They let the painting, they let, the, they let these guys come all the way down to Denmark, different country. I can assure you, Philly PD won't let them go to Camden. <laughs> <laughs> Not with a painting from the Barnes or, or the, or the, the Leather Museum of Art. Wouldn't happen, all right? They had to stop them. But in this case, they let them come to another country. All right. So they come to, to Denmark. They get off the train. They walk back towards my hotel. One, the guy with the bag, he stays outside uh, on the corner. The other two guys come up to my room. And what we're going to do first is frisk them because I want to make sure they don't have weapons. Uh, you know, they were out of my sight for a day. They were doing their running rounds. If they came back with a gun, you know, the thing we worry about is they come back and do what we call a reverse. And that's where they rob me and sometimes shoot me. Okay, so... You know, Mr. Whitman likes it when I come home with the same amount of holes. <laughs> but as long as I play the insurance bill, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, she, uh, they come in, and I'm going to do that. Now, you can't ha hear anything because we don't have an audio today. But what I tell them is the reason I'm doing this is because if you steal the money, the Russians will kill me. You see? Yeah. So he says, no problem. <laughs> That's no weapons. That's because you're actually watching the undercover videos from the uh, hotel room. So that's good. No weapons. I'm doing well. Next, we're going to have to show them the money. 250000 in cash. Now, I've done this quite a few times up to this point in Spain and in Peru <laughs> and a lot of places. Anyway, when I do this, you can see what, the, what they're looking at. And what's great about it is when they're looking at this, they're not looking at me. And that means there's no suspicion. You see, they're counting the money. And it's all $100 bills, all in the bed. So he's making sure it's all legit. And it's all there. And it was. It's all real money. It's what we call show money in the business. You see it, you see it okay? Yeah. So he does that, and he's, he's satisfied. That's good, right? So we're good. So now I say, look, you've seen the money. 
Do you know everything's right? We've been doing this for too long. Go get me the pig. Remember, I don't know where the pig is, right? I know he's a guy's outside, but I'm not supposed to know that. They say, okay. So they're going to go get us the, get us the painting. Well, they leave the, the hotel room, and they're going maybe five to seven minutes. I'm thinking, this is taking a long time. I get a call from the Swedes again. They say, something went wrong. I said, what happened? He said, they ran away. I said, what do you mean they ran away? He said, they took off. Do you want us to arrest them? I said, no. I said, wait, see. If they get back on the train, then stop them. But see where they go first. Don't stop them until then. And they said, okay. For about the next 10 minutes, I'm, 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 I'm pacing back and forth in that little room, trying to think of what I possibly could have said that set them off, right, that they figured this out. And I'm thinking, man, I really messed this up. We've been working on this thing for six months. So I finally get another call. And it's Swedish police again. They say, everything's okay. They're coming back. I said, what happened? So they had gone, and a fourth guy had come down the night before. He was staying at another hotel. He had brought the painting. So as a result, the thing that they were carrying was a decoy. So had the Swedes stopped them, or anyone stopped them to begin with, they would have been found out. And there would have been nothing happening, because there was nothing in the bag. So they went to that other hotel where the guy came in the night before, and they got the painting. And now they're on their way back. Uh, that fourth guy had already been arrested. So that was a good thing. So they come back, and next thing we're going to do is we're authenticate it, make sure it's real. Uh, this is where the Barnes training came in very, very well, because you know I'm not a Rembrandt authenticator. It's not what I do. Uh, but I also know that you, know, you have to look at the backs of artwork, because there's a lot of information there. <clears throat> I had gotten great photographs from the museum, and on the back of the artwork were four screws that held the painting into the screw, into the, into the uh, frame. And they were turned at certain angles. And when I looked at it, I could see that the angles were still the same, the way the screws were turned. So I knew they never took it out of the frame. So that tells me it's the original. So I said to him, I said, you never took it out of the frame, did you? And he looked at me and he said, of course not. It's a Rembrandt. <laughs> I said, excuse me. You know, I, I, you know I, I didn't know you guys were art lovers. And they looked at me and he said, well, we're not. We just want the money. But even they knew that what they had was a real Rembrandt. I mean, they were in all of it, too. And it was funny, because I said, I really said, excuse me. Remember Steve Martin used to say that? <laughs> so I was, I was talking at the, uh, at the Whitney, and Steve Martin was three rows back. <laughs> and I, uh, I told that story, and he started laughing. <laughs> I said, I have to send you a check, right? I mean, because it's too fine. But anyway, so we, uh, we authenticated at that point. So there's nothing really for me to do. Now I'm just getting a conversation you know, on tape and getting information from them about how they stole it, what happened, you know, what the situation was. And we know that it's legitimate. So at this point, there's nothing left to do but the bust. Uh, you can't hear it because there's no audio, but I say in there, this is a done deal. That was the code term for the SWAT teams to come in to arrest these individuals, grab the painting, save the day so I would be, you know, I would be uh, saved and the painting would be saved and be nothing, everything would be great. Um, watch how long it takes. Every, every second's a year. Watch. So we're standing there looking. I stop right here. I say, it's a done deal. You can't hear it, that's what I'm saying. So the SWAT team's coming in now. Now they're going to rush in and save everything. Here they come. Here they come. Oh. <laughs> Okay, now I'm hiding in the bathroom. <laughs> All right, finally they come out. <laughs> Yay! So at that point, I run out of the bathroom, I run down the hall, and I turn the painting over to Chris. Remember the agent from Los Angeles? He was there. I gave him the painting. He takes it upstairs to a safe room, and we put it on the bed. And I put the 250000 in cash in front of it to take that picture. And I never thought I'd ever show it in public. It was my own, my own edification, you know. But that's a great picture, because that's what it's all about. It's all about the Benjamins. <laughs> That's our crime, all right? We got a $35 million painting on a little hotel bedroom, a bed with $250,000 in show money in cash in front of it. And that's what it's all about. How many people here are fishermen? Anybody go fishing? You know how you take the fish, the shot of the day, the catch of the day photograph? That's that. <laughs> That's that photograph. So again, this is a great uh, case to discuss uh, art crimes, the importance of cultural heritage protection. What are the piece of property? And really, that's what that is. 
What other piece of property with three nations work together to recover? Denmark, Sweden, United States. Why? It's a Rembrandt. It's cultural heritage. It belongs to all of us. You know, it's in the Swedish National Museum, but it's all of our heritage. So I hope you enjoyed this today. This is uh, what, what, what our show is about. I saw, I saw Bill walking up, so I knew I had to quit. <laughs> and it's not a Saturday. <laughs> uh, we have time for two questions from the audience. I see a very... Would you comment on the new book that just came out? Can you mind? About the couple that went on a rampage of stealing art and friends. Uh, the uh, Stefan Breitweis, uh, is that yeah, a question? Have you read that book? I, I have looked at it, yeah. I know the story. Uh, was I've actually called on some of those thefts. So the question is about the new Art Thief book that came out. Uh, it was about Stefan Breitweiser, who was the French thief who was going in doing uh, basically shoplifting, you know, in small historical societies. Uh, that happens a lot, you know. We have had cases here where, you know, one in, in one instance we had at the Philadelphia uh, History, uh, what is it, the uh, Historical Society. We recovered 200 pieces that were stolen from there over a seven year period. The British Museum recently had a curator that they fired who was stealing pieces over many years and selling them one piece at a time on eBay. Usually these pieces are not of, this, of the ilk of a $35 million Rembrandt. They're small, hard to identify, very cheaper pieces. But in his case, he was going in just for the thrill of it and taking these pieces uh, and so finally he was caught. My understanding is his mother threw a lot of that material into a, a lake and was destroyed. Set it uh, on fire. Set it on fire. Well, was it on fire? I don't, he, I don't, some of that material was thrown into a lake too. Right. And there was a fire that was set in Romania by another set of art thieves who stole some beautiful paintings that were very valuable. Uh, they were burned by, by the guy's mother so that the evidence wouldn't be found. So that's what happens. That's the problem. <laughs> You know, we were lucky to get these pieces back, but at any point, they could have been destroyed, and that would have been a loss for all of us. So yeah, I recommend the book. It's a good book. Um, not as good as Priceless, but it's a good book. <laughs> Just my, my personal opinion. Another question? Yes, ma'am. Has, has there been an increase in this kind of art theft? What I would think would be a less, because you can't get rid of the art. It's identified. It's all over. Everyone sees the picture. We know the internet's all over. Is it just the unsuspecting going to eBay? Or is it the, the prices now that go to the little small stuff that they can get away with? Yeah, I've seen, you know, the, well, you, you all heard the question? OK. So yeah, I've seen a lot of um, smaller pieces being stolen. You know, not these $30, $10 million pieces, $35 million pieces, because as you say, you can't get rid of it. There's nothing can be done with it. Um, the sin comes when they steal the smaller pieces and they melt it down for the for the metal work, the metal quality. You know, uh, they'll steal something that's got historic value, and then they melt it just for fifty dollars worth of gold, you know, or a hundred dollars worth of gold. So those those are the problems, and that's what you see uh, today in today's art theft world. I don't see a whole lot of theft as much as I see frauds, forgeries, and fakes. Yeah, I mean, I see the biggest. Uh, fraud forgery case was uh, the Nodler Gallery. Happened a few years ago, and I was the expert witness in that case for the Southern District of New York. And uh, it was a $65 million fraud with all the fake paintings that they had sold to collectors around New York. <clears throat> and so, in that case, wasn't criminal. That part of it. That was a, a civil case where all the collectors were suing the gallery to get their money back. So it was very interesting. So that's what we see: these big fraud cases. <clears throat> Will you join me in thanking Bob for this intriguing talk? Mm -hmm. This is so fun, and um, the morning is just full of energy, and um, I'm Katie Adams, and on behalf of all of our colleagues at the Barnes, I just want to thank Bob again for a fabulous presentation, but each one of you, I think, as you look to your, the left and to the right, you see old friends and new friends, and the great part is we've all taken classes here at the Barnes, and we love 
the power of looking and seeing and transforming lives. Whether you're looking at paintings or living, living objects in the Arboretum, the Barnes is education through and through. That is the heart of our mission. And so we thank you in every way that you participate um, by taking classes, being a member, joining the Legacy Society, and continuing to share the Barnes and the love of learning with others. Um, so we would love for you to continue to do so, and we'll join the fellowship. Um, upstairs, we have the reception in the Annenberg Court. Uh, the collection is open, so you can go find some old favorites, as well as Alexei Brodovich, Astonish Me. So please enjoy the rest of the morning. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you.